This is a phenomena. Caitlin Clark is a phenomena. And if I said to any of these people who think Caitlin Clark is not the rookie of the year, I'd say, who would you want to start your franchise with? Now, I'm not going to put Asia Wilson in there. I'm just saying between these two. Angel Reese is a wonderful player, but she does not compare to what and who Caitlin Clark is. Angel Reese drew attention this week when she argued that, in addition to Caitlin Clark, she is also part of the reason fans are tuning into the WNBA in greater numbers. It all started from the national championship game, and I've been dealing with this for two years now. And understanding, like, yeah, negative things have probably been said about me, but honestly, I'll take that because look where women's basketball is. People are talking about women's basketball, but you never would think that we'd be talking about women's basketball. People are pulling up to games. We got celebrities coming to games, sold out arenas, like just because of one single game. And just looking at that, like I'll take that role. I'll take the bad guy role, and I'll continue to take that on and be that for, the, for my teammates. And if I want to be that, and I know I'll go down to history, I'll look back in 20 years and be like, yeah, the reason why we watch in women's basketball is not just because of one person. It's because of me, too, and I want y'all to realize that. Reese's comments sparked debate over how much credit she deserves versus Clark for the WNBA's rise in popularity. Longtime radio host and sports broadcaster Dan Patrick made it clear on Tuesday that whatever role Reese has had, it doesn't match up with the Caitlin Clark effect. By the way, speaking of basketball, uh, Caitlin Clark uh, now has the rookie record the history of the WNBA as uh, she's now going to try to set the all-time record, but 12 games to go. Now, this is happening exactly how I scripted it. I told you this is going they, – they loaded up the schedule, front end, front loaded, Caitlin Clark on a bad team, you know, the worst team because they drafted her, number one. They were going to load up against better competition, and she played an entire college basketball season. And she didn't play well. And I said at the time, she didn't deserve to be on the uh, Olympic team. And at the time, I felt that. But she got rest, the schedule not as demanding, and now you're seeing Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese are battling it out for the 2024 WNBA Rookie of the Year trophy in their first professional campaigns. Both first-year players are shattering WNBA records, reaching milestones, or achieving notable statistical accomplishments at every turn. And both are making exceedingly strong cases to take home the Rookie Award. However, longtime sports media personality Dan Patrick doesn't think the race is particularly close. During Monday's episode of The Dan Patrick Show, Patrick dubbed the debate silly, saying Clark is the clear WNBA Rookie of the Year. It's been a rough couple of days for Angel Reese. Turns out she's been getting the cold shoulder left and right. A a a a Angel Reese played a good statistical game last night in a blowout loss to the Phoenix Mercury. And, and Angel Reese has actually paying the cost at this moment from attaching her brand to Caitlin Clark's brand. Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese continue to put on record-breaking performances since the WNBA resumed. The Indiana Fever guard passed Ticha Penichero for most assists in a single season, 224, by a rookie. Clark handed out her 225th assist in the second quarter against the Seattle Storm and already had 232 with a dozen games left. Meanwhile, Reese had a 19-point, 20-rebound night against the Phoenix Mercury. She fell a point short of becoming the first rookie in WNBA history to have 20-plus points and 20-plus rebounds in a game. The Chai Barbie, however, became the fastest to hit 20 double-doubles, needing 27 games to accomplish that. She averages 12.3 rebounds per contest, which is already the best ever mark. Despite those numbers, Dan Patrick isn't buying the idea that it should be an argument, giving Clark the superiority over Reese. And look, Angel Reese, there, there's nothing that she does where you go, did you see her? Other than she plays really, really hard, and I liken her game to Moses Malone. Moses Malone was relentless. So it's not that I don't appreciate who she is or how she plays. There is no one, no one like Caitlin Clark. In the history of the WNBA, I mean, you had somebody who was the all-time leading scorer in college basketball history who plays for Las Vegas, and nobody talked about her. Nobody talked about Kelsey. Wonderful player. Nobody talked about her. Caitlin Clark is just different.
and you saw that yesterday again. The ROT battle between Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese will only heat up as the regular season finish line draws near. How both rookies carry their respective teams to the playoffs could determine the winner of the race. Clark has gained a slight edge in that category after back-to-back -back wins. Meanwhile, the Sky looked out of rhythm in their last three games. They decisively lost twice to the Phoenix Mercury before eking out a 90-86 win over the LA Sparks on Saturday. Reese has been putting up impressive numbers, but her OT bid will suffer if the Sky falters. Two straight wins improved Indiana's record to 13-15, while the 2-1 slate by Chicago dropped its mark to 11-16. The Atlanta Dream 9-17 is nipping at their heels and could chase one of them in the home stretch. Angel Reese spoke to the media. She didn't speak to the media after the game against Caitlin Clark, but a member of the Chicago Sky, the uh, national title winner at LSU. And uh, she talked about where all this attention started with her and Caitlin Clark, and uh, she had this to say. It all started from the national championship game, and I've been dealing with this for two years now. And understanding, like, yeah, negative things have probably been said about me, but honestly, I'll take that because look where women's basketball is. People are talking about women's basketball, but you never would think that we'd be talking about women's basketball. People are pulling up to games, we got celebrities coming to games, sold out arenas, just because of one single game. And just looking at that, like, I'll take that role. I'll take the bad guy role, and I'll continue to take that on and be that for my teammates. And if I want to be that, and I know I'll go down in history, I'll look back in 20 years and be like, yeah, the reason why we watch watching women's basketball is not just because of one person. It's because of me, too, and I want y'all to realize that. If she would have left it with what she had to say right before the last couple of words, I would have been fine with it. She's embraced the villain. She understands social media. She's done quite well. Uh, she is cashed in, literally cashed in, but her attention, uh, her notoriety is based off Caitlin Clark because she wins the national title. First thing she does, she mocks Caitlin Clark, and then she doesn't even celebrate with her teammates. So she's made it personal with Caitlin Clark. Then she's played off of that. Even Caitlin Clark getting knocked down in that game on Saturday Who's standing up applauding but Angel Reese? So she's sort of embraced a Draymond Green role here. But the eyeballs on the WNBA really have to do with Caitlin Clark. Now you might, if you stay long enough, maybe you'll see something or someone that you go, okay, I'm entertained by this. But there's nothing wrong with admitting that you watch a sport because of one singular person. People watch golf because of Tiger, right? You tuned in. No matter what event Tiger was playing, you were going to watch. They're still trying to capitalize on him. Playing in the U.S. Open. NBC and Peacock, their graphic has Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy, and then who's looming larger on the screen but Tiger. So they're still trying to squeeze everything they can out of Tiger. When Gretzky got to the L.A. Kings, Messi goes to the MLS. Maybe Connor McDavid with Edmonton. You're trying to... There's, there's somebody you may tune in to watch, and then maybe if you watch, then maybe you appreciate what you're seeing. WNBA has been around a couple of decades, and people didn't notice the game. They're noticing it now. Well, that's because of Caitlin Clark, not Angel Reese. Angel Reese has played a role in this, and she's a, a very good player. But there's nothing about her game that's really interesting that is going to translate to people who may not watch the WNBA, may not care about basketball, she is a social media star, and she has capitalized on that. And maybe she embraces being the villain. But make no mistake about it, Caitlin Clark is the reason why everybody has an opinion on what happened in that game. It's Caitlin Clark. Now, do I think it was assault, as the Chicago Tribune said? No, it was not. It was a hard foul. It's wrong. You don't need it in the game. And there's a lot of things that came out of that. People bringing it. You can bring in race. Do I think everybody's jealous of Caitlin Clark? I don't. But I do think they are out to prove a point. You're not coming in and dominating our game. Because we are grown women and we are going to be physical with you. Now, dirty? Then I have a problem with that. But you're playing tough. It's competition. And now everybody has to have an opinion. And now you have got... I, it feels like we're, we ruined it. Like, okay, you wanted our attention, now you got our attention, now you're like, wait, hold on here, let's not bring in all these other things here. How about can we just watch the game? Can we appreciate the game? 
Welcome to life as a woman when men get involved. Yes. We got involved and ruined everything. It was going just fine. Yes. But now we jumped in, ruined it, and then we're just going to be like, ah, oh, now nah, you guys figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I don't I don't like the other narrative. Like you have the gatekeepers now. Like, hey, we've been playing basketball a long time. Where were you? No. We're watching because of Caitlin Clark. I didn't watch the MLS. Messi started playing. I watched the MLS. People watching Tiger. Tiger, you know, they didn't play golf, but there was Tiger. There was something about him. You have a singular figure here, but now you have everybody who has to have, there's a referendum here, an opinion. Uh, you think you know the game. Uh, you know what, you know, how are they playing? Oh, they're, they're rougher on her. What, what her teammates need to do is stand up for her. I would start with that. And the commissioner of the WNBA has got to take control of this to say there's hard fouls but then there's going above and beyond the call of duty. That's where you got to be careful with this. And I don't care who it is. Angel Reese got fouled earlier this season in a game against the Connecticut Sun. That was a dirty play. And I don't know if anybody singled that out. But she, that, that was a, a, a potential injury waiting to happen when she fell. And the angle that she fell. But I didn't hear anybody, there, you know, no referendum on that. It was... It was a hard foul, and it was a flagrant foul. But Caitlin Clark, I don't want her to get all the calls, but I also want her to be at least treated fairly if you're going to officiate a game. Now, she got all the calls it felt like in college. Here, she's not. And, you know, she's doing her best to try to sell a foul, but if you're going to have hard fouls on her, that, I think, uh, reflects poorly on the WNBA. Treat her fairly, and uh, as far as jealousy goes, I think it's just competition. You're out there. You want the best player. I want you. I want to shut you down. I don't care what it takes. I mean, this is their livelihood. But I, I, I think Angel Reese is jealous of Caitlin Clark. She thinks she's, you know, the reason why this is all happening here. Caitlin Clark was going to get eyeballs whether she played against Angel Reese in LSU or not. Because we had not seen anything like this before. Her style of play. There's great players in the game. Wonderful players. You know, I go back to Diana Taurasi. I love watching her play. She's still playing. What is she, 41? I think she just had 31 points the other night. I mean, Sue Bird played at a high level. So many great players. I mean, I go back to, to Cheryl, you know, Cynthia Cooper, Tamika Ketchings. I mean, there are so many great players. But maybe they didn't capture your imagination. Caitlin Clark has. People watched. Now everybody wants to have an opinion on this. And that's where it clutters, muddies up everything that the women have tried to do. They've been there. You just haven't noticed. Now you're noticing, and now you have an agenda. Now you have an opinion. And that's where, no matter what you're saying or who's saying it or how you're saying it, everybody has a platform now. Boy. It's interesting. I the, the Angel Reese cut, I had heard it yesterday, and they only cut it to the last 8 seconds, 10 seconds. To hear it in context, though, she does have a lot of points about what the situation actually is. She is clearly not the draw and not the type of player that Clark is. She's a good, college, very good college player and a good NBA, WNBA player. But that incident in college at LSU, Iowa, took that sport and broke it out. And it, we spent the entire offseason talking about, can we get a rematch of these two? It, it set up the senior year for Clark. Now, she is not the star player in this play, Reese but she has a big element in the past year and a half of basketball. I agree with that. She played the role of villain, but it was personal with her. I don't think it was personal with Caitlin Clark, but it was with Angel Reese. She was clearly bothered by Caitlin Clark and the attention, but people aren't tuning in to watch Angel Reese play basketball. Angel Reese against Caitlin Clark, then they'll watch that. I, I, and I love having a rivalry. I said that yesterday. We don't have enough rivalries. Now, the WNBA has a right when Chicago and Indiana play, you'll watch. Like, what are the rivalries in the NBA? Where you go, golly, they don't like each other. What is it? Load management and the fans. Yeah, that's the rivalry. There's no, the way it used to be with Philly and the, the Celtics or Celtics and the Lakers or the Knicks against the Celtics. What, what is your rivalry? There is no. And I do appreciate a good rivalry. Baseball had the Red Sox and the Yankees, which wasn't really a rivalry because the Yankees always won until the Red Sox won. Now you have a rivalry. Like the Giants and the Dodgers. Rivalry. 
but you don't have many of them. And I I love to have that where you tune in because it it just feels like it's more than just a game. There's tension there. These guys don't like each other. These women don't like each other. Fine with that. It's competition. Do you think that Angel Reese is very calculated recently with what she's doing? And I'm complimenting her. She made a lot of money NIL-wise her last year at LSU. And it feels like she's embracing this role and leaning into it and even leading into any criticism off her comments because she knows it's going to pay her back because she can't make money on the floor in the WNBA. You have to make it off the floor. No, no, she's done well. She's capitalized. As long as you're willing to wear the black hat, you're going to be the villain. As long as you're willing to do that, then fine. It's like Draymond Green likes to be the bad guy until he gets criticized being the bad guy. And he's like, wait a minute here. No, you want to be the bad guy, then we're going to criticize you when you go above and beyond the call of duty. But Angel Reese, playing the social media game all the way to the bank. Dan Patrick has his sure roti winner, but the debate off the court and the battle inside will continue growing more intense. With the regular season down to about a month, basketball fans expect a wild finish for who wins the award in the end. Who do you think will win the WNBA Rookie of the Year award between Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Jason Tatum will follow Caitlin Clark's surprising approach at the 2028 LA Olympics, Gilbert Arenas predicts. If I want to play and the answer was yes, then you just say, hell yeah. This right here <laughs> is hell no. <laughs> so it's a lick my ass. <laughs> what can Clark do to them at the All-Star Weekend? <laughs> I think I need some rest. Y'all want yeah. me for the three-point shooting contest? I need yeah. some rest. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Then show up. That's their White right now. Would you be in 2020? Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? For real? Yeah, Y'all want me to play right now? Let's go. <laughs> it's like when they asked Ann if you play on another World Cup team. He said, oh, hell no. Nah. <laughs> Quick, you, you start giving shit like this? That's a slow fuck you. U.S. athletes. Athletes eagerly await to compete on home soil in Los Angeles in 2028. However, one player, Jason Tatum, might not participate as predicted by Agent Zero. After hearing Tatum's diplomatic response about whether he would like to participate in the 2028 Olympics, Gilbert Arenas claimed that Tatum might take a similar approach to Caitlin Clark's and politely decline the opportunity to avoid the Olympics. If I want to play and the answer was yes, then you just say hell yeah. This right here, this is hell no. If you start giving shit like this, that's a slow fuck you, Arena said, referring to Tatum's statement. Pointing out Clark's polite move during the All-Star Weekend, Arena's mimicked her words. What can Caitlin Clark do to them at the All-Star Weekend? I think I need some rest. Y'all looking for the three-pointer in contest? Yeah, I need some rest. Contrary to fans' expectations, the Indiana Fever rookie did not participate in the WNBA three-point contest, choosing instead to rest and focus on her mental health. It's just like, I need a break, Clark had said, after turning down the opportunity, calling it the biggest thing. Tatum had to sit out both the games against Serbia and ended up averaging 17 minutes per game. Many were displeased with the number, including Charles Barkley and Jeff Teague, who even declared the Celtics star would definitely opt out of the Olympics. Jason Tatum, he's done with the Olympics, bro. He's never going to play in the Olympics again, he had remarked. But what did the 2024 champion and 2020 Olympic gold medalist have to say? Jason Tatum to think rationally. As previously mentioned, the 5X NBA All-Star clarified that his experience in the 2024 Olympics won't impact his decision for 2028. Tatum shared with fans that the Olympics experience has been tough for him, but when it comes to participating, he won't let his emotions dictate his decision. He said, If you asked me right now if I was going to play in 2028, it is four years from now and I would have to take time and think about that. So I'm not going to make any decision based off how this experience was or how I felt individually. Agent Zero has been particularly vocal about his frustration over Tatum's benching. He even called out Coach Kerr for the questionable decision, though the coach has repeatedly clarified that it was tough to decide who would play. At the end of the day, Tatum only takes it as a learning experience. It's definitely challenging and humbling at the same time, he adds. One of the top scorers in 2020 Olympics, Tatum ended his Paris campaign averaging 5.3 points, 5.3 rebounds, and 1.5 assists. Jason Tatum publicly backs America's outrage against Steve Kerr's Olympics disrespect. 
Even as Team USA walked away with a gold medal at the 2024 Olympics, the debate around Jason Tatum's playtime hasn't ended. From Bob Cousy to Dick Vitale and even Tatum's mother, everyone questioned Steve Kerr's approach. After all, Tatum was just fresh out of an NBA championship win. American rapper Vince Staples also showed his support for the Celtics star, and it seems like Tatum wasn't too happy with his treatment in Paris as he showed his displeasure on Instagram. In the six games that the Team USA squad played at the 2024 Paris Olympics, Jason Tatum was benched for two of them. He didn't start Team USA's campaign opener against Serbia and missed out on the semifinal against the same opponent. Even in the games he appeared, the player only averaged 17.7 minutes. In comparison, LeBron James and Stephen Curry, the two leading scorers, averaged 24.5 and 23.3 minutes respectively. Tatum's playing time didn't even cross the top 50 mark when compared to all the players who participated in the tournament. This treatment of a player who made it to the All-NBA first team in the last three seasons hasn't gone down well. The 26-year-old took to his official Instagram account, resharing a tweet on his story from Vince Staples. Uh, it's, it's a learned experience. Um, over time, you learn how to deal with um, all the extra noise and, and attention, uh, whether it's positive or not so positive. Uh, and, you know, I'm a fair, smart person. I know when I'm doing things at a high level. I know when I need to do certain things better. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, like, oblivious to, to what's going on. But at the same time, just keeping the main thing, the main thing, and, and um, focusing on trying to win the next game. Uh, you know, that's what's most important at this time. Uh, Joey Mistretto with Clutch Points. Um, I wanted to ask just about Kyrie, and um, you know he's a great player. He's had some struggles in the series. What do you think you guys are doing well against him, and do you think he's just missing open shots? Um, I mean, that's part of it, right? You, you never, like, completely shut a guy as talented as, as him out. Um, and you've heard it a million times. With great players, you just try to make the things difficult, show them different coverages, um, just want to make them work for everything. Uh, they're going to make shots, they're going to miss some shots. Uh, you just don't want it to be easy for them to be comfortable. Uh, and that's what, you know, any talented player. Tim here on the left. Here's some Tim Reynolds with you. Okay, two things, if I might. The first one, um, Matthew Kachuk is watching a lot of the NBA Finals. He said, he's two wins away, you're two wins away. How much have you followed what, what they've been doing? Yeah, uh, I'm a big Matthew fan, right? We know that we were... Uh, we went to school together, uh, and I actually watched. I watched him win last night, um, uh, trying to learn and understand the rules in, in the game of hockey more and more. But uh, you know, I, I got to watch the game last night, and they won. Uh, so, like I said, I'm extremely happy for him and his family, uh, and hopefully, they they win it all. The other thing, it's only two games in the finals, and. Like the first question alluded to, there's all this talk about your shooting numbers. How much would that have bothered you when you were younger? Because you're up 2-0 and you're averaging pretty close to a triple-double. I know it's just the two games, but it's not like you're playing poorly. How much does the fixation on just one number, how much does that bother you? And how much have you learned to just not worry about that stuff so much? Uh, yeah, I think being in the finals two years ago has helped. Uh, has helped me in this moment. And like I said, like I understand that I do need to be more efficient. I do need to shoot the ball better. Uh, I wouldn't dis I would not disagree with anybody on that. Uh, but, you know, I'm not letting it bother me, right? I'm, I'm still trying to find ways to impact the game uh, and, and dominate the game in, in other areas. Uh, and. I understand that it could take one game. Uh, one game I could explode and, you know, all those, the, the percentage and, and things like that could change. Um, so it's just that mindset of, you know, I'm, I'm one game away or, or whatever that means. Uh, but it, like I said the other day, I know what it's like to, to be in this position and lose. And, you know, just this time around trying to do any and everything possible to have a different outcome. Uh, 
So yes, I know I need to shoot the ball better, uh, and, and I plan on it, but not letting that affect um, everything else that I need to do on the court to help us win. Sam, standing over on the left. Sam Amick, The Athletic. Jason, uh, your coach just had a fascinating discussion with this gentleman in the front row from Brazil, uh, essentially comparing you to Neymar and the idea that superstars get scrutiny and, and he thinks a lot of it is unfair. Um, does that mean a lot to you? And, and behind the scenes, have you guys had those kind of talks where you contextualize the spotlight component of your experience? Yeah, uh, and that's, that's one thing I, I truly do appreciate Joe, aside from being, uh, I think, an excellent coach, uh, is that I, I truly do believe that he cares about us, our team as individuals, and you know, obviously myself, the, the conversations that, that we have. Uh, and he always, you know, through the season, the summertime, and obviously through this postseason, uh, have had days where he's called me or called me into his office. Um, and not necessarily talk about X's and O's, but um, check on me as a person and, you know, how I'm dealing with, with everything. Um, and that, that, that does mean a lot for somebody to take time out of his day to um, show that, you know, compassion or, or whatever and just know that, um, you know, he's there for me. Um, that relationship between, you know, yourself and the coach is important. And uh, that's something I, I truly value about the relationship that me and Joe have. Having watched Team USA's gold medal Olympic run and how the 2024 NBA champion mostly occupied the bench, Staples tweeted, We will avenge Jason Tatum on Sunday. By highlighting the message to his 8 million plus follower base, the player is not hiding his true feelings anymore. Earlier on August 9th, Kerr defended his decision to bench Tatum for the most part. It's not what I'm not seeing from Jason. It's what I've seen from the other guys, the Golden State Warriors head coach said. Prioritizing 12 players in a five-man team, when all 12 of them performed exceptionally during the recent NBA season, is no easy task. Tatum may have accepted this fact, but he still wasn't happy about it. Tatum played for a total of 71 minutes in Paris, the second fewest number in the team. Kerr did rotate his team, but Tatum often found himself looking in from the outside. Tatum averaged 5.3 points, 5.3 rebounds, and 1.5 assists during the Olympics, numbers not befitting of someone who drove the Boston Celtics to end a 16-season championship drought. As it turns out, Vince Staples isn't the only known figure who is not pleased with Steve Kerr's apparent treatment of the player. Celtics legend Bob Cousy told the Boston Globe that Tatum being benched wasn't just a snub. He added, this is an embarrassment for that poor kid all over the expletive world. The Olympics have gotten that big. Everyone's going to think that there's something wrong this, this kid. Former college head coach and basketball sportscaster Dick Vitale was also baffled with Kerr's tactics. He tweeted, Someone Paulus let me know is at J Tatum zero injured as he hasn't received the PT playing time you would expect an all NBA player to get. Tatum's mother, Brandy Cole, responded to the tweet and wrote, No, he not. But if you find out what's going on, please let me know. Unacceptable and makes no sense. Last season for the Celtics, Tatum averaged 26.9 points, seventh highest in the league. He also averaged 8.1 rebounds and 4.9 assists during the franchise's march to the championship. Former Milwaukee Bucks point guard and 2021 NBA champion Jeff Teague stated that Jason Tatum being benched will have long-term consequences, as the player's reputation in the domestic league may not remain the same, while Boston Celtics owner Witt Grousebeck held the belief that, to him, Steve Kerr's decision-making regarding his player is a mystery. Jason Tatum may go on to hold some resentment at the moment. Will it mean his future with Team USA? especially at the 2028 LA Olympics is in doubt? Uh, it, it, it's a real feeling. Uh, still hasn't really kicked in yet. I, just trying, I guess, enjoy the moment. I kept saying, wow. Uh, these last seven years have been a roller coaster, up and down. I had to listen to all the shit that people said about me. And tonight, it was worth it. Oh my God. To be able to say we did it, 
We came together and we won a championship. Banner number 18 has been hanging over our head for so many years. Uh, to know that we're going to be in grave history. Uh, and it still hasn't like registered. I'm just still trying to process it all. But we did it. We won a championship. Over here on the left side. Jason, I'm curious to know what you said to Deuce after this, but I guess I'm more curious, what did Deuce say to you? Yeah, he told me that was the best in the world. I said, you damn right on it. Gary, third seat. Dad, it was, it was, all the sacrifice was worth it. Uh, I'm so thankful to have been in the positions that I, I was growing up. Uh, thankful for my mom, thankful for my dad putting, you know, introducing me to basketball, my grandmother who helped raise me, uh, all my friends and family that have supported me, uh, every coach, every teammate that I've had. Uh, there's a lot of people that have had a hand in the success of Jason Tatum. Uh, so I guess in this moment, I'm just very thankful for it everybody that supported me in the highest of moments and, and, and in the lowest of moments. Uh, I'm very, very appreciative of that. Matt, over here on the left, second row. Jason, given that this is a night you'll remember forever, what does it mean to you to have had the game that you had tonight, to not, to not only win, but to have been aggressive and to, to have have played the way that you played in a championship winning game? Uh, I mean, this is this is going to be a night that I'll remember uh, the rest of my life. The, the game, the celebration, these moments. Uh, you know, I, over the last couple of years, we had some tough losses at home in the playoffs. And we've lost the NBA championship at home in front of our fans. We uh, had a chance to beat Miami in game six a few years ago and, and lost that one. Uh, so to have a, a big win, the biggest win that you could have in front of your home crowd, um, I, I felt like that was really important to go out there and uh, do everything in my power to make sure we won this game tonight. Ramona, left side, fifth row. Hey, Jason, Ramona Shell, we're in ESPN. Um, I know you, you've talked a lot about Kobe Bryant as one of your idols and, and somebody you've had in your, your game after and your motivation after. Now, and once you finally win a championship, you kind of, now that you can say, I know what it took, right? What, what did it actually take? Was there something from Kobe that you learned? Was there, was it just something you learned on your own throughout this journey? What did it actually take to get over that hump? Uh, it took a, it took being relentless. It took, um, you know, being on the other side of this and losing in the finals and being at literally the lowest point in a basketball career that you could be. Uh, to next year, to the following year, thinking that that was going to be the be the time and uh, come come up short again. Uh, so, I mean, people have said it before, but coming up short and having failures makes this moment that much better because uh, you know what it feels like to lose. You know what it feels like to be on the other side of this and, and be in a locker room and hearing the other team celebrate and having them celebrate on your home floor like that was devastating. And now, to elevate yourself uh, in, a, in a space that you know all your favorite players are in, everybody that they consider greats or legends have won a championship. And all the guys I looked up to won a championship, multiple championships. Uh, so now I can, I can like walk in those rooms and, and be a part of that. It's a, it's a hell of a feeling. Uh, this is, is more, I dreamed about what it would be like, but this is 10 times better. Cassidy, last question in the back. Cassidy Hubbard, the ESPN. Jason, when Jalen won finals MVP, the first thing he did was look at you and said, we did this together. What did that mean to you? Uh, first, first of all, congrats to him. Uh, uh, Well-deserved. Extremely happy for him. Uh, this was this is a hell of an accomplishment. Uh, the main goal for us was to win a championship. Uh, 
we weren't, we didn't care who, who got finals MVP. Uh, I know that I, I need him through this journey and, and you know, he needs me. Uh, so, to, you know, it was great to see him have that moment and share that moment with him. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely happy for him, well deserved. Uh, that, was, that was big time, he, he earned it. Thank you. Jason Tatum provides an update 2028 LA Olympics plans. The next Olympics will be prominent for the Team USA squad. After all, it will be taking place on their home turf, right in the vibrant city of Los Angeles. While three big players from the 2024 squad, LeBron James, Stephen Curry, and Kevin Durant, may not look to return due to them being in their 40s, other young athletes like Anthony Edwards and Tyrese Halliburton are highly expected to shine. While Tatum was not happy with how things panned out in Paris, he has chosen to not rule out the 2028 LA Olympics for now. It was a tough personal experience on the court, but I'm not going to make any decisions off emotions, Tatum said as reported by Adam Himmelsbach of the Boston Globe. Opening up on his LA 2028 ambitions, he added, if you asked me right now if I'm going to play in 2028, it's four years from now. I'd have to take time and think about that. So I'm not going to make any decision based on how this experience was or how I feel individually. Tatum also expressed his disappointment earlier at not being used enough during the games while mentioning he has had support. A lot of people text me and reached out and said, make sure this fuels you, which I appreciate. There's a lot of people that care about me, Tatum said. I think the tough part is, yes, you can use things to fuel you, but I'm still human," he said. Tatum's situation has taken some shine off USA's gold medal triumph, even when the Celtics star called for it not to take away from the team's success. By winning the gold, Kerr's selection and tactics were justified, but for Tatum, Paris may not be a highly memorable outing from an individual point of view. He will look to answer many questions when the new NBA season tips off and lay down a marker with the LA 2028 in sight. The Olympics may be over, but the excitement is just beginning. Team USA brought home the gold, but now everyone's wondering, could we see some of these superstars teaming up in the NBA? LeBron and Steph lighting it up together, KD and Booker joining forces, the possibilities are endless. We've seen Olympic teammates become NBA powerhouses before, from the Heatless to the Warriors dynasty. Will Olympic chemistry lead to NBA championships? Let's break it down. Now for the question you know you've been dying to ask for three weeks about the Team USA Men's Basketball Avengers. With their gold medal mission accomplished, which players on this star-studded squad are going to join forces on an NBA team down the road? With the national team's rich history of such things, it's only natural to wonder. The Miami Heatless trio of LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh that teamed up in 2010 had USAB roots, as they grew close while playing together in the 2006 FIBA World Cup in Japan and Beijing Olympics in 2008. The Golden State Warriors dynasty had a similar story, with Kevin Durant, Andre Iguodala, and Stephen Curry bonding in Turkey at the FIBA World Cup in 2010, then finding a way to come together six years later. Iguodala and Durant were also together on the 2012 Olympic team in London. Just last week, longtime NBA veteran and ESPN commentator Kendrick Perkins claimed that James Harden, while playing for Team USA at the London Olympics, was strongly encouraged by his superstar teammates to leave his sixth-man role with the Oklahoma City Thunder that summer and pursue a more worthy role elsewhere. He would be the centerpiece of the Houston Rockets by that October. But the tricky part about this phenomenon, and the thing that makes it so hard to handicap whether we'll see a super team spawned out of the Paris games, is that you'd need telepathic powers to figure out if any of these all-stars are truly thinking about playing together down the road. This sort of process isn't typically linear, with other developments needing to unfold on each player's respective NBA squad before those Team USA connections come into play. What's more, the freedom that comes with free agency, more often than not, plays a part. Yet when it comes to the relationships that appear to have grown these past four weeks, from Las Vegas to Abu Dhabi, London, Lille, and the City of Light, there are a few worth highlighting and monitoring. 
But the thing to remember, and the factor that always plays a pivotal part when stars decide to align, is that it all starts with the competitive status of their current team. To that end, we begin with two legends in advanced age who have eight NBA championships between them but whose teams missed the playoffs entirely last year. Let's talk about LeBron and Steph. This one gets top billing because of what went down at the February trade deadline when we learned Curry's Warriors made an unsuccessful bid to the Lakers for LeBron. That sort of breadcrumb, one that was so fascinating to consider after all the years they'd spent as rivals during all those Cavs-Warriors NBA Finals face-offs, tells you two things that still remain relevant. Curry had given a thumbs up to the idea, which reflects a level of comfort between the two, even before they worked so beautifully together en route to Olympic gold. The Warriors clearly had intel, suggesting this was a pitch worth making. At the time, James was approaching his possible free agency, and there seemed to be enough questions as to whether he'd want to stay in Laker land that it led to a conversation between Golden State owner Joe Lacob and the Lakers' Jeannie Buss. At the time, James signaled he'd rather stay put, and the whole idea died on the vine as a result. But he would go on to sign a two-year, $100-$1.4 million deal, one that includes a player option in the second year and a no-trade clause. Point being, the same Warriors-Lakers dynamics could be there again this upcoming season, especially if the Lakers are struggling in the kind of way that makes James rethink his strategy in these final few years. As a relevant side note, Team USA our Warriors coach Steve Kerr seemed to click with James all the way through as well. There's one massive problem with that plan, though. Bronny James now plays for the Lakers. It's hard to imagine LeBron wanting to go anywhere now that his son is wearing the purple and gold. So, could the 36-year-old Curry become so fed up with the diminished help around him in Warriors world that he heads for the exits and somehow pairs up with the 39-year-old James and fellow Team USA star 31-year-old Anthony Davis? It seems unlikely what with Curry's stated goal of playing his entire career with the Warriors, but he's a competitor of the highest order, one who just saw his team say goodbye this summer to his beloved backcourt mate Clay Thompson, this summer while failing in its pursuits of Paul George and Laurie Markkinen. With that backdrop, it's worth a reminder that he made this ominous comment to Yahoo Sports' Vincent Goodwill while at Team USA's Las Vegas training camp in early July. It's always been my goal, and I'm saying that sitting in this chair right now, Curry said about retiring with the Warriors. But like you said, life, and especially life in the NBA, it is a wild environment and things change quickly. In terms of Curry's contract, he has two seasons left, $55.8 million and $59.6 million, and is eligible to add one more year on an extension this summer. Warriors general manager Mike Dunleavy Jr. made it clear what the organization wants, telling our Anthony Slater that Curry can have whatever he wants and that he is pretty confident he will be a warrior for life. The fact that they clearly enjoyed each other's company, constantly goofing around at practices and celebrating with such joy together after the biggest of wins, is of equal importance. When it was over, after Curry put France to bed with that three-point flurry and said Nuit Nuit before closing the door, James decided to post the picture that perfectly captured their shared spirit. The news conference after the Team USA gold medal game, with Kerr, Curry, and Kevin Durant all raving about one another on the same podium, was the kind of thing I never could have imagined five years ago. It happened from start to finish, with Durant and Curry sharing a mutual admiration society news conference at the start of the Olympics as well. When Durant left Golden State for Brooklyn in free agency, there was a fair amount of shared baggage from their three years spent together. You don't have to be Dr. Phil to figure that out, as Durant came very close to winning three consecutive championships, within a torn Achilles tendon in fact, yet chose to head for the exits. But feelings evolve over time, and Curry and Durant spent the entire Team USA journey sharing the kind of deep reverence that was there during the best of times in their Warriors days. On Curry's side, it was notable the first-time Olympian would routinely reference Durant's three gold medals, now four, and standing as the best Team USA player of all time. Durant in turn spoke glowingly about who Curry was and remains both on and off the floor, 
Yet while the Warriors are clearly on the prowl for another big-time star, and with a known commodity like Durant certainly fitting that bill, Phoenix Suns owner Matt Ishbia emphatically insisted the 35-year-old wasn't going anywhere in late June in response to speculation of a possible Durant departure. NBA draft night is the best. Everyone talking about the drama and storylines, some are right and some are just wrong. Matt Ishbia said, My turn. Phoenix loves Kevin Durant and Kevin Durant loves Phoenix, and we are competing for a championship this year because we have the team to do it. Gotta. But how might Ishbia feel if they fall short again? Or Durant, fellow Team USA member Devin Booker or Bradley Beal for that matter? Only time will tell, but the Suns' first round loss to Minnesota in last season's playoffs wasn't the sort of start any of them envisioned in their first season together. When the gold medal game news conference was nearing an end, after they all fielded several questions about Curry, Durant, and James, Kerr grabbed the microphone and announced that he had one more thing on his mind. Devin Booker is an incredible basketball player, said Kerr, who chose to start Booker for every Olympic game en route to him, averaging 11.7 points, team best 56.5% from three, and 3.3 assists. Nobody asked about him, but he was our unsung MVP. I just wanted to say that. Curry, in turn, posted Kerr's quote on his Instagram story and added the caption, damn straight, while tagging Booker's account. For someone like Kerr, who is typically bound by the NBA's tampering rules that tend to suppress an opposing coach's public enthusiasm for another team's stars, the Team USA environment allows him to speak his mind in the kind of way that could aid a recruiting effort one day. That's not to say it was his intent, as Kerr seemed deeply genuine about Booker's contributions. Even still, it's a pretty convenient way to show a star player like Booker the kind of love he'll never forget. What's more, the truth about the Suns is that rival teams are monitoring the desires of Durant and Booker. The Rockets, to cite one example I reported in late June, are among those teams that have Booker on their wish list. But again, Ishbia has pushed back hard on this premise that these Suns will fail, and he'll be forced to blow it up amid all that pressure from the unforgiving luxury tax. They're more invested in Booker than anyone else, with his contract running four more seasons for a combined total of approximately $220 million, and the notion of him being available anytime soon seems very unlikely. To hear Booker tell it at Team USA's Vegas training camp in early July, he's every bit as invested in this Suns group as Ishbaya. I mean, I've never seen an owner do something like that before, Booker said when I asked him about Ishbia's tweet about Durant. It just shows you what type of guy Matt is. He's all in on the group that we have. We believe in the group that we have and the talent that we have. It's not easy to win a title. So I think having that hurt together and that experience together in the playoffs is going to help us moving forward. Boston went through it before winning it all in June. Obviously, the Celtics edition of Drew Holiday last summer helped out a lot. But yeah, moving forward, you know, you live and you learn, and I think experience is the best teacher. Truth be told, we could workshop these fascinating scenarios all day. Anthony Edwards and Durant became fast friends who were dynamic together in Team USA's second unit. So does that mean the 23-year-old Minnesota Timberwolves star might find a way to persuade his favorite player to force a trade to his frigid part of the country? Don't count on it. From either side. After Minnesota's run to the Western Conference Finals last season, and with Edwards's star on a meteoric rise, it's so far so good for him with his current core. Joel Embiid was desperately in need of help a few months ago, but the Philadelphia 76ers are all set for their next push after landing George in free agency and re-signing Tyrese Maxey. Could Heat big man Bam Adebayo, whose running mate, Jimmy Butler, can be a free agent next summer, find the help he so desperately needs among his Team USA pals? Perhaps, but there are no visible dots to connect just yet.